the projector starts, and so begins this episode of Movie Nights and Matinees, the podcast for people who enjoy movies from when we actually had to go to the movies. I'm your host, Bill Groves, and this is episode 25, Malton on Malton, in which Jim Reed and I welcome as our first guest of 2024 none other than Mr. Leonard Malton, whose work as a film historian has had a tremendous impact on both of us as fans of classic cinema. You'll have to pardon us for not welcoming him with the familiar theme from Entertainment Tonight, but we still have our own classy music, courtesy of Tyler Trayband. everybody. Thanks for listening. You know, we've talked about episode 24 having been the first anniversary episode of Movie Nights and Matinees, but that's actually based on the rollout of episode zero, which was more of a preview than an actual episode of substance. Consequently, I think there's a case to be made for this being our true first anniversary episode, made all the more noteworthy by who we've lassoed to be the first guest of our second year. On the off chance that any of you are movie buffs, you just may be acquainted with his work. He became a familiar face on television as Entertainment Tonight's movie critic for some 30 years, as well as providing commentaries and on-camera introductions for many films packaged for home video. He's authored numerous terrific books about movies, as well as his recent autobiography, Starstruck, My Unlikely Road to Hollywood. He's founded his own film festival, teaches a film course at USC, and is even a fellow podcaster. Of course, in saying that, I feel a bit like Barney Fife referring to Elliot Ness as a fellow cop. Of course, I'm referring to Mr. Leonard Malton, whose current cinematic activities, including his Malton on Movies podcast, on which he appears with his daughter Jessie, can be accessed at leonardmalton.com. Leonard, welcome to Movie Nights and Matinees. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, let me just say how happy, honored, and thrilled I am to have you as a guest. There are many more such applicable adjectives, but we have limited time, and there's no point in dragging Roger into this. At the risk of violating the lesson of Chapter 2 of your autobiography, Starstruck, I'd like to begin by sharing some historical context. For one thing, it's incredibly appropriate that Jim is taking part in this conversation, as it was he who first introduced me to you, which is to say your work. As a fledgling classic film buff, I was fascinated with a paperback book called Movies on TV by Um. Stephen Scheuer. And at some point I was over at his house and uh, mentioned that book. And he said, well, you know, there's another guy named Leonard Malton who's done a similar type of guide, but it's better. And that was my introduction. And then followed up with, he showed me his copy of movie comedy teams. And I eventually had my own copy of that. And that to this day remains my favorite movie reference book. Well, that's very flattering. There are times when I think I've met every single person who owns that book, movie comedy teams. It came out at such a, the world was so different then. Paperback books were sold in Woolworths, in drugstores, on spinner racks, in card and gift shops. And this was before the mall, the mall ing of America took place and B. Dalton booksellers came to be and then Borders and then eventually Barnes and Noble. And uh, I benefited from that, that turn of events, benefited tremendously. And now it's gone back, the pendulum has swung the other way and it's hard to find a bookstore. That's true. At the time, you didn't have to go to a bookstore to find movie comedy teams. Go to the same place you bought comic books and see this book it was priced at a dollar and a half, which was just about affordable for a lot of teenage, mostly guys, <laughs> <laughs> who liked Laurel and Hardy or Abbott and Costello or the Three Stooges or the Marx Brothers. And that's why I say I, I, I think I've met all my readers because uh, it was not a huge hit, but it was a modest success and has uh, stood me in good stead all these years. 
Well, I have four copies of it, so I'm, I probably have helped you succeed there a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, as I've mentioned in prior episodes, my introduction to the appreciation of classic films was the Marx Brothers. And I don't know if I, by the time I got my own copy of movie comedy teams, if I had Joe Adamson's book, but nevertheless, your book furthered my knowledge of Laurel and Hardy, the three stooges, Abbott and Costello, and introduced me to really, well, the Ritz brothers, I had, I think just learned existed, but I knew nothing about them. So you filled in that gap, introduced me to Wheeler and Woolsey, Clark and McCullough. It's just to this day, uh, I just love that book and refer to it quite a bit. This is actually the first time we've been able to have a complete conversation. I did meet you. Well, we had some correspondence a number of years ago. And later on, when I did Television Chronicles, you were complimentary about that project. And I finally got to meet you at a, you were doing a Q&A at Dave's Video mm-hmm. in Sherman Oaks, the Laserdisc store. The late lamented Dave's Video. Right. And you were talking about this new technology coming out called DVD. And you had this, this Q and a session and I tried to ask a question and I, to this day, I cannot think of the way I could have phrased it. It was kind of a technical question, but what I blurted out, you, you somehow managed to provide an answer, even though I, I didn't succeed in framing the question intelligently had to do with the whole PAL NTSC thing and how that might impact the availability of foreign titles and that sort of thing. But I did get to meet you. And so that was uh, that was a bonus for that. I mentioned in passing your autobiography, Starstruck. My wife, Debbie, and I both read it. Well, actually, we both listened to it, the audiobook version, and loved it. It, it was terrific. And hearing you tell these stories, you know, in your, your life, in your own voice, I just, I have to wonder, after chronicling the careers of so many other people in the entertainment industry, what prompted you to tell your own story? Well, the pandemic has something to do with it. Being locked here in my my home, where I normally actually work, wasn't a big change, but it gave me time and a motivation to get up every morning. I had a project to work on, and I had a publisher called Goodnight Books that was interested in publishing it. So that was a, that was a happy set of circumstances, and it seemed like a good time to. I think a lot of us had an opportunity trying to make lemonade out of lemons to reflect a bit, maybe more than a bit during that lockdown period. Yeah, my experience with other guests has been that the pandemic produced a lot of books. It mm-hmm. turns out, so let's say the silver lining in that cloud yeah. certainly. But as I said, uh, Debbie and I both loved it. And she, I'm so glad. yeah, she just raved about how it felt like she was listening to a friend talking about his experiences. And it occurred to me also, you know, I think I need to get a hard copy of the book. So I'm going to recommend that to people. I would, you should go, you should listen to the audio book and you should get the hard copy because on the one hand, there's just no substitute for hearing, you know, the man tell his own story and stories. And by the same token, I thought, you know, there's probably some really cool pictures in the hard copy. And so I got myself a hard copy and sure enough, there are some great photos in there. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a good double dip opportunity. Well, may your listeners take your advice and may their tribes increase. (laughs) Now, this of course is one of the things that will be in the book, but I I think it probably is useful to dive into here for the benefit of people. I mean, there's bound to be someone that, you know, is going to run across this podcast who maybe isn't that familiar with you. And so by way of introduction, how was your love of movies first cultivated? Honestly, through television, because I'm a child of the first TV generation born in December, 1950. So I never recall there not being a television set in our home, in our apartment, where we lived till I was four. And TV in those days was a living museum of movies. They had to fill up a lot of time. And in New York, we had seven channels, which was a lot more than many communities had. And they had nothing but time to fill. So they filled it with old movies. And during the uh, morning and late afternoon hours, they decided that that was a great place to show cartoons from every conceivable source and old comedy shorts like Laurel and Hardy. And our gang, a.k.a. the Little Rascals, 
and the Three Stooges and similar stuff. So that's where I first was swept up by all of those things. Plus watching Walt Disney, watching Walt Disney every week, hosting his own hour long TV show, which was originally called Disneyland. The show existed before the park was completed. And I felt a connection to Walt Disney. And I, I still do. In fact, I feel strong connections to all of those things that I watched and absorbed and took in. Get that Roger out and we'll find other words for that. But I absorbed all of it like a sponge. Sounds like Bill and I were helped by your television watching because we both grew up in Tulsa, which, of course, has three television stations or had three television stations at that time. So we didn't have the kind of movies that you had in New York. That's why the movie comedy teams and the great comedians, especially I was really interested through movie comedy teams and Olson and Johnson. Mm. And it took me a long time to get to see Olson and Johnson, you know. But it was just, it sounded so fascinating in the book that I, I just couldn't wait to finally find a film and watch it. Imagine my joy and delight in selling that idea to a publisher. I had just published my first book, the original book called TV Movies, which eventually became known as Leonard Maltin's Movie Guide. And that got my foot well in the door at the Signet Books, which was then a division of New American Library. Today it's Penguin. It's Penguin Random House, so it's part of a giant publishing entity. But they were willing to hear out my ideas for another book. And I submitted three ideas, two of which I thought were fairly commercial. And then the one that I really wanted to do for myself, for my own satisfaction. And that's the one they took, and that was movie comedy teams. Uh, speaking of TV movies, I just wondered, and this is something I hadn't really intended to ask, until fairly recently that the idea crept into my head. So straying off the path a little bit here, but I wonder with the various staff members that you brought in who contributed the synopses and, and ratings and so forth, how often did you get into debates with any of them about their opinion of a movie versus your own? Well, when we got up to speed, we did the first book. First book came out in 1969. And I was a freshman at NYU. And it was five years before they asked for an updated version of the book. That was the first chance I had to fix mistakes, expand on some reviews that I thought were a little too terse first time around, add cast members, do things like that. That was in 1974. Then they took four more years to ask for another, and that was 1978. And then in the early 80s, we went on a every other year schedule, biannual. And within just a few years, the mushrooming of home video, this is the 80s now, early 80s, made it obvious to my publisher and then to me that we had to go to an annual schedule. And it was that was quite a process. So it was a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> but by that time, I had acquired a staff, nobody working full-time, but everybody working steadily, of people I trusted and whose opinions and whose knowledge I relied on. But every review passed under several sets of eyes, not just mine. That was important. So if I hadn't seen a movie and assigned it to someone else, I still knew about the movie. I was keeping up with, you know, with the current periodicals and with the trade papers, Variety in particular. If someone wrote a rave review of a film I'd heard was terrible, then I either reassigned the review or went to see the movie myself. Okay. Yeah, the, the reason I felt compelled to ask that is just from some of the things that I've read in some of your books, it seems as though you and I, from what I can tell, and I don't know, maybe you hear this from everybody, it may just be one of those things where everybody sees something, some commonality, but I see some similarity in taste as far as I can tell. For instance, your lesser opinion of the first Gremlins uh, that you mentioned in your in your book, Starstruck. I wasn't crazy about that either. I thought it was too violent to be funny and too screwy to be scary. Uh, I like the second one better, which you happen to be in. And you talk about that in Starstruck. So that just kind of made me wonder because there's a movie in there and I'm trying to get Jim to watch this one. He hasn't seen it called Fire Sale, the Alan Arkin comedy. Mm -hmm. It got a bomb rating in your book. It's the only movie that's ever made me literally laugh myself sick. Now, it's it's kind of off taste 
comedy, but it's from the, the it's from the writer of Where's Papa and Weekend at Bernie's. So it's consistent with that. And I just wondered, yeah, I wonder if he's actually seen that one and, and, and what his opinion of that movie is. It's been too long. Okay. Well, it obviously didn't etch itself in your memory the way it did no. mine. But not, not etch indelibly. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, you referred to animation and the cartoons that you watched. What I think people who haven't read your book don't necessarily know is that you had a personal interest in cartooning. And for a time, it seemed like that was going to be a career path for you. Yeah, as opposed to animation, which is a different thing. I wanted to be a, like a magazine cartoonist doing the kind of spot gag cartoons that only exist now, I think, in The New Yorker. The other long-time holdout was a Playboy magazine because Hugh Hefner wanted to be a cartoonist when he was young. Really? So he had an abiding affection for that medium, that specific aspect of magazines. Yeah, there was a book I read at the library called Drawing and Selling Cartoon, and I tried to follow its instructions rigorously. I still have my rejection slip from the Saturday Evening Post and the New Yorker, to whom I submitted cartoons. That was just, a, I guess, an example of chutzpah, I guess, the best way to say it. But, you know, it's what I thought I was going to do until I realized that I didn't really have the talent. I wasn't really good enough. And I started writing more. And writing took up my need to express myself. Yeah, I can uh, I can empathize with that, too. I had a fling with doing some comic strips uh, in junior high, and it turned out my artistic ability is about on par with that of Junior Tracy. Mm -hmm. People who re remember Dick Tracy will get that reference. So have you used your skill as an illustrator since doing the, oh, the fanzine? Because no. I think you mentioned that you you did some drawings in the fanzine that you were publishing. Well, very, very, very early. When I was in the fifth and sixth and seventh grade, I still tried to draw some some spot cards. I just didn't have what it took. And you didn't share any of those in Starstruck. Uh, I would have been curious to see those. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I did send samples of my work to Charles M. Schultz, and he wrote back the most wonderfully encouraging, kind letter to me and enclosed a signed Peanuts original daily strip, uh -huh. which uh -huh. was a flabbergasting moment, if there is such a thing as flabbergasting. <laughs> and it's framed and still hanging on my wall, of course. And about 30 years later, I got hired to interview him for a video that was going to accompany a, a touring show to museums celebrating Peanuts, uh, I think, 30th or 35th anniversary. So I'm sitting down with this very kind fellow in his studio in Santa Rosa, California. And I told him that story. And he said, he jumped out of his chair. He said, oh, we've got to get you something newer. He went over to one of his desks and went through a bunch of Sunday original scripts done in India Inc. Found one that he liked, and he signed it to my wife and me, and signed it Sparky, which was his nickname, to friends and family. So talk about living a full circle, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a story you tell in Starstruck, just one of many terrific stories uh, that stood out. Which book would you say you're most proud of? Oh, gosh, uh, I'm proud of them all for different reasons. I'm proud of the first books I did because there were no books covering those topics. It was not a book on comedy teams. When I did my book, The Disney Films, even the people I became friendly with at the Walt Disney Company told me they didn't have a complete list of their films yet. They had not yet hired Dave Smith, who became their first longstanding archivist. I preceded him. <laughs> wow. Uh, the Great Movie Shorts was another topic that meant a lot to me, and I got to a lot of the people who were involved in making those films, one and two reelers, and it was all original research, including photo research. So I was very proud of that. And then I wrote a book on the history of American animated cartoons, and there was no such thing on the bookshelf. So those all have deep meaning to me. And they filled the different gaps for my readers, my potential readers. I got a, I got a quick question. <laughs> when you put out the Our Gang book, I noticed that it said Our Gang on the cover. But then when the, when the paperback came out, it said Little Rascals. Yeah. I decided that uh, it couldn't hurt. Uh, so many people only know them as the Little Rascals. I thought and we'd had great success with that book. 
our policy did not believe in that book at all. In fact, they thought they had a, a dog on their hand because the Nostalgia Book Club turned it down. And instead, it just kept going back to press and back to press and back to press and stayed in print for a good long time. And then about 12 years after the first book was published, both Dick Ban and I had moved to Los Angeles. And he in particular had learned so much from spending time with Hal Roach and spending time going through the Hal Roach studio papers that uh, we felt it was time to do a proper revision. So it wasn't just a reprint, it was a revision. And that's when we decided, let's try Little Rascals this time. I really enjoyed when you used to come to Dallas to do uh, the programs at the USA Film Festival. I enjoyed doing those. Yeah, you did one on short subjects and one on uh, animation, I remember. Mm -hmm. You and Bill Everson really made that really worth going to. Bill Everson made anything worth going to. Yeah. William K. Everson. Yeah. In doing your research for the various books, what would you say... If you can point to a single thing or if anything stands out, what's the biggest scoop, for lack of a better term, you got? Some piece of, some nugget of information that no one else had ever touched? Oh, well, I don't think I can isolate a nugget. I talked to people that no one else had talked to or no one else had bothered to talk to in many cases. And most of them have since passed away. Some of them later became good resources for other authors and other uh, fans. Hard for me to pick one thing, but I was proud of getting Pete Smith to write the foreword to my great movie shorts. This past week, my wife and I have seen two Pete Smith specialties on Turner Classic Movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never got to meet him in person, but we we corresponded. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, a, a unique voice in the history of cinema there. Exactly. Of the interviews you've done, who was the hardest one to get? Uh, Well, there's two phases of the interview. The one when I was a kid, knocking on the door, like what I was, like a young fan, trying to get through to the person and not having to go through an agent or a publicist or some other gatekeeper. Then when I started to work for Entertainment Tonight, everything changed. It was a big hit TV show. And that opened almost all doors. So what I think about when I think about that is the ones that got away. I came close to interviewing Stanley Cooper. Hmm. I was set to interview Federico Fellini, who was supposed to be coming to Montreal for a film festival there. And I was going to meet him there. He got ill, canceled his trip. So that's what comes to mind. But it was E.T. that, which I did one of the first interviews Catherine Hepburn had ever done for television. Jumping ahead a generation, I got, I think, the second television interview Robert De Niro ever granted. Oh, you know, covered a wide swath. Of the interviews that you've done, are there any that, for whatever reason, you didn't expect to go well, but they ended up going much better than you expected? Well, a more, a more contemporary figure, James Spader, Oh, who just wrapped up a nine-year or something like that run TV show, Blacklist. He'd made a film called Primary Colors with John Cusack, and I was assigned to go to the press junket by Entertainment Tonight. And the, the film was okay, nothing special. And I wasn't a particular fan of his. I mean, he, you know, he's a good actor, but but I didn't even do my homework properly. As I was driving over to the hotel where the press junket was taking place, it talked a little about his background in North Andover, Massachusetts. Well, that's was the home of dear, dear friends that we used to go to visit almost every uh, Christmas and sometimes in the summertime as well. And my friend was a dorm master and we would go when school was out of session. So we would stay in one of the better rooms, and bring our dogs and they could run free in the field of prep school. So when I sat down with James Spader, I deliberately tossed out something. I said, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream at Benson's? There's a little mom and pop ice cream stand that only existed in the summertime. He said, how do you know about Benson's? And then we were fast friends. We were off and running. He even knew my friend who had taught at the Brooks School there for many, many years. 
So there's an example of having no expectation. And instead of an awkward Q&A, a delightful session with somebody who also appreciated the people he had worked with. He told me a great Robert Mitchum story. It was the day I'll never forget. Hmm. Well, you've stumbled upon the magic word. Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit and get into the realm of home video. Mm -hmm. Back in the, uh, this would have been, I guess, the 80s. Yeah, because it wasn't long after I was out of college. I was working in a video store, and among the titles we had was the series put out by Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers Night at the Movies. Right. And you appeared in that uh, doing introductions, and essentially hosting the program the way it was structured. Now, was that something that you had come up with, or was that brought to you? It was brought to me by George Feltenstein, a friend of mine and a hero of mine, because he's done so much for film buffs in his roles at what was then MGM UA Home Video, which owned the old Warner Brothers Library before it was sold to Ted Turner, and then at Turner Entertainment, and now at Warner Brothers. And that was a that was the kind of gig that almost embarrassed to take the money. <laughs> Notice I said almost. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And did that plant the seed in your mind for what later became the Disney Treasures series? No, unrelated. Okay. Well, speaking of the Disney Treasures series, uh, there's one in there, and you talk about it in the book, and it, it stands out for me because it's one of my all-time favorite Disney productions. And that's the Dr. Sin DVD set, A Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, as it was originally presented in three parts on the Sunday night Disney show. Does that one hold a special meaning for you? Uh, I mean, is that how it found its way into the Disney treasures? Because there's obviously so much Disney material to choose from. It's just the one instance. We did 37 volumes in that series. And it's the one instance where they told me that there was so much fan interest in Dr. Sin, they've gotten so much mail, the days of snail mail, and so many, some, I guess, calls and any kind of communication in name, save the internet, which wasn't in existence yet. They said, there's tremendous fan interest in this. We've got to do this. So that was a no-brainer. I imagine, probably like so many of us, that you saw it in its original incarnation on the Disney uh, TV series? When it aired that three-part presentation, yes. Did you have any uh, affection for it? I mean, any thoughts on it? I did. I liked it. I liked it very much, like everybody else. Yeah, that was that was great. Yeah, that that memorable theme song. We found out there was a guy here in town in L.A. who had interviewed Patrick McGowan, and we were at that moment unlikely to get him on camera. He'd become very reclusive, so we paid this fellow and used his very well shot interview with Patrick McGowan. And that sort of made the disc, you know, more appealing to the fan. Wow. I, I was especially glad to have snatched it up as soon as it became available, because apparently it sold out very readily. It sold out in weeks, a matter of several weeks. Yeah. And as you mentioned in the book, that despite pleas to the contrary, Disney was not interested in doing another, uh, another run of it to produce more. No, no, they said they had no interest in that series altogether, they were not fans. They were just following orders. <laughs> but we got them done. And I'm very proud of that. And it was my idea. I'm proud of that, too. Right. Yeah, you recount that in the book. Uh, once again, uh, just another chance to plug it. Starstruck. Everybody should read it. It's a, a really well-told and fascinating story. One thing that struck me, and I don't remember which which book of yours I read this in, is just that you're favorite genre is comedy mm -hmm. but your favorite movie is casablanca there's no contradiction there oh no i'm not saying it's a contradiction <laughs> but it does seem interesting <clears throat> that it falls outside of your favorite genre well yes but but humor is a key ingredient in casablanca well that's true and it's it's got many funny and lighthearted moments and the cast is they're, they're just can't be beat just can't be beat. I tell people it's got everything. It's got comedy. It's got romance. It's got suspense. It has timeliness. And excellent writing. Excellent writing. Oscar-winning cinematography. And a cast that is perfectly chosen down to the very 
tiniest roles, people who only have one line of dialogue, are perfect. They're colorful and interesting. Not just Bogart, Bergman, and Paul Henry. Everybody up and down the line is, is ideal. That just puts me in mind of uh, something. This this came up back in the episode with Kendall Kruver talking about her travel guide, Movie Buffs Travel Guide. And I'm thinking you may have run across this. I was telling her of my memory of a McDonald's over behind the Cinerama Dome that was themed as Casablanca. Did you ever see that or visit there? How could I have missed that? I, I don't know. I miss the McDonald's. Well, it's still there, but the McDonald's on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City mm -hmm. uh, that was right across, is right across the street from CBS Radford, which is now just called, I think, the Radford Studio, and which was originally Max Senate, and then for 20 years, Republic Pictures. And then it was the MTM Studio. And in one of their rooms, they had a wall of framed 8 by 10s all the people who worked at MTM, Mary Tyler Moore and that whole cast, Bob Newhart, all that cast, Hill Street Blues, all of those actors. And I'm sure it was the only McDonald's that could boast of that until they wanted to build a play area. And they built a play area and took away all those photos. Oh, wow. Well, this, this McDonald's over there was fascinating because they used the the I don't know what the term would be, the, the style of, of tile uh -huh. that uh, was used in the architecture there. They had a, a small replica of the Rick's Cafe American neon sign at the counter where you'd order. They had tablecloths that were, I guess they were vinyl, but they looked How like- How did I not know of this? They looked like palm fronds, and they had a replica of the piano over at one side. Now, I don't know if they ever had anybody playing it or not. Oh, and the chairs, they were molded to look like bamboo. Uh huh. So it was just fascinating. I, w I wish I had gotten a picture of it. I, I would have seen this th in my first visit to L.A. So this would have been early 82 when uh -huh. I saw this. The shame. I've done a search on the Internet. I cannot find any photos of it, but I remember it vividly. Now, this, again, ties in, I guess, maybe a little bit to the the personal favorite issue. And and it maybe ties into the book you did 151 movies uh, i don't have it in front of me it's 151 movies you've never seen yeah that or the best 151 yeah. movies you haven't seen but that just puts me to mind if the, if there is a and it doesn't have to be just one maybe two or three i know that, that there are maybe three or four that immediately pop into my mind but if you're wanting to recommend a movie that the average movie buff probably hasn't seen what are the first few titles that pop into your head? Well, I have a new one to add to that list, so I'll give okay. you the first. Great, breaking uh, news. There's a film about to be released called The Monk and the Gun, and it comes from the country of Bhutan, which had never submitted a film to the Academy Awards, but did four years ago, or no, five years ago, 2019, and that film is called Lunana, A Yak in the Classroom. It is an absolutely disarming film. You don't know what to expect. You don't know what kind of story it's going to tell. Will I be able to relate to this? Where is this exotic place? It takes care of all of that and takes you on a journey. The story isn't startling about a guy who hasn't really committed to anything in his life and career, who gets sent as he's a school teacher he gets assigned to go to the remotest village in this remote country high high up on the mountaintop it takes five days to get there and they have no power no water no running water no internet connection and he's supposed to teach school children and of course he does and he falls in love with the place and wants to stay so that's not as a startling but it's the journey, not the destination. It's the journey that counts. His new film is called The Monk and the Gun. And I showed that to my class at USC last week. I have 340 students, and only some of them are film majors. They're from all over the university. And they rarely agree on any film that we screen. But when I asked this past Thursday night how many liked the monk and the gun, every hand went up. And this is a tough audience to please. But they were so charmed by the film and the filmmaker, who was a very charming guy. 
so the one that's available on Netflix right now is called Lunana, A Yak in the Classroom. You can thank me now. You can thank me later. Okay. Well, I'll thank you now then. Now I will have to go check that one out. Now, another thing I wanted to ask, and uh, gosh, I have such a laundry list of questions I could ask about specific films, but it, it wouldn't fit in here. I'm wondering, I have what I've called my list of shame, movies of some repute that just for no particular reason, I have never gotten around to watching. All About Eve is one of them, just as an example. I was wondering, do you have any kind of list of shame movies that are well known that just haven't gotten to? None that I admit to. <laughs> <laughs> there, oh, there, at some point in my uh, growth and evolution as a film buff, I realized that there were films, mostly epic films, from the 50s and 60s that I hadn't seen, but I didn't want to watch on a television screen. I wanted to see on a theater screen. I decided, and I've never changed my mind, I decided that I would sacrifice seeing them until I could see them properly. And so there are some epic films, biblical films, popular in the 50s and 60s that I still haven't seen. You're not going to share them with us, though. No. <laughs> okay. All I've right. got a question that, that kind of takes us back to the uh, the books, especially on the early books that you did. How difficult was that to compile those filmographies? That was, uh, that was a job of work, as they say, but a job of great satisfaction when I did them and they turned out right. Mm -hmm. I managed to get the information correct. I used all sorts of means. I talked my way into the storeroom, I guess you'd call it, of a warehouse that held the 8 by 10 still negatives for several major studios, including Columbia Pictures. And when I was doing the great movie shorts, I wanted to have cast lists for every, not, not just the three studio shorts, but the Andy Clyde shorts, the other short subjects that they made. Well, I couldn't see all of them. I couldn't get prints to screen of all of them, but I could hold up the still negatives. And if you held them a certain way, these eight by 10 negatives, in the light, you could see who was in them. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I built cast wow. lists. <laughs> oh, man. That's an interesting technique I've not thought of. Okay, this is just one of those examples, something that just popped into my head. I would not have expected to even mention, but. Your book, Movie Crazy, I think it's Movie Crazy. At the back, you have a chapter on movies that were rescued from obscurity or complete loss. And you mention a series in there. And I, I for some weird reason, I just find I have a certain fascination with film series. Uh, a lot of the ones Columbia did. Things like Crime Doctor. And I recently discovered, well, recently, as in within the last year, doing an episode on Blondie. And how I was surprised at how much I enjoyed those, that sort of thing. I never expected, oh, and, and I should preface this by saying what originally led to Television Chronicles indirectly was I was working on what I envisioned as a book project. It was going to be an encyclopedia of movie series. And so I had hundreds of pages of filmographies that I had built up there. And until I saw your movie crazy book, I thought that I would never see in print any other reference than my own typed pages to scatter good banes. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I've still never seen any of the films, but I know it exists. I, I know that series exists. And I thought, Oh, wow, validation. It does exist. Guy Kibbe exists in real life as well as on screen yeah. forever in our heart. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like one of those situations where maybe you're up late and you see a movie on late night TV and it's so incredibly bad that very short order, you think, did I really see that? Does that film really exist? Only to find, you know, run across a few years later. Yes. Curse of the Swamp Monster was actually a film. But Guy Kibbe doesn't exist in Convention City, so. No, that's sad to say. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I read about that one. That's too bad. Well, I mean, who knows? Is that is that one that could turn up in you know somebody's basement in Alaska, or did it not ever even get released? I don't remember. People have gone to South America in the hope that Warner Brothers distributed it there in 1933. 
turned over every rock imaginable to find some remnant of Convention City, but it doesn't seem to exist anywhere. Uh, and that's not one where there was a Mexican production using the same sets uh, shot no. at night or anything no. like that, where we'd have no. an approximation of it. Well, that's too bad. There was a, a legal reason that they destroyed that, right? The prints? I don't remember. I don't remember the backstory of why. Yeah. That, that's what I had in my mind. Maybe right, maybe wrong. I don't know. Well, speaking of movie mysteries, now, now this is going to be just a personal indulgence for me. But there are a couple of movie mysteries that have haunted me for a number of years. And I just I have to wonder if you might have any insight into them. Of course, the 1941 Maltese Falcon classic, John Huston, Humphrey Bogart, and so forth. But of course, 10 years earlier, there was a production starring Ricardo Cortez. I'm very fond of that one. Yeah, yeah, I like it too. The Maltese Falcon statue. Now, the, the, the Bogart Maltese Falcon statue has been you know replicated and it's very iconic. The one from 1931, is there any clue as to what became of that one? No one talks about it. I just read a piece in a new issue of Vanity Fair about the prop from the 1941. It doesn't even mention the earlier version. Of the film. Wow. Well, I mean, I actually did see it turn up in another movie on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's is the John Wayne Western Haunted Gold. You see it sitting on top of a piano. Julie Wilson's miniature piano from Casablanca turns up in a couple of other Warner's movies of the 40s. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's probably in some Citizen Kane-like warehouse somewhere. Uh, that's what I'm wondering, if anybody has ever thought to go into the Warner Brothers prop warehouse and look for it. Well, Warner or... Brothers, and they've, they've, they've combed it pretty well by that. Oh, and so they... I didn't know if anybody had thought to look for that one. Okay. Now, the other question I have, and this may just come down to opinion, and that is the titles, the, the credit sequence for Damn Yankees. My theory is that those were created by Saul Bass. I mean, they've got the same style you see in Around the World in 80 Days. I mean, it just seems to have his fingerprints all over it, I, there, but there's no credit for it on screen. And even when I worked at the Warner Brothers archives and was looking at documents, like budget documents, I thought, okay, somebody would have written a check to whoever did the credits. I didn't find anything. Do you have any knowledge of that or even an opinion? No, I'm sorry to say no. Mm. And I'm a huge fan of Saul Bass. Getting to interview him, that was exciting. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. wow. That would have been been very cool what any any great stories or, or insights from that no he told me he was a railroad buff at the time there was a vogue for rubber stamps using rubber stamps creatively to send snail mail as we now call it so i found a set of like three rubber stamps that made a good looking railroad and i sent him a thank you note and he wrote back and when he wrote back he signed it saul and then had a rubber stamp of a fish bearing his face. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I've thought for years there really should be an Oscar named for him, awarded to creative title sequences. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Do you have and any uh, upcoming books, projects, or appearances that uh, you want to share with us? I'm working on several projects that haven't been nailed down yet, so I can't talk about them properly. But I'm going to be at the Santa Barbara Film Festival in two weeks. It's February 9th, Friday, February 9th. I've done these tribute evenings for them for about 35 years. They used to call them the Modern Master Award. And about seven years ago, Roger Derling, who runs the festival, said, what would you think if we renamed it the Malton Modern Master? Well, it's very flattering. So now it's called the Malton Modern Master. And... Mm -hmm. On February 9th, I'm going to spend an hour and a half to two hours on stage with Robert Downey Jr. Oh. Reviewing his career, his life and career. And mm -hmm. that'll be fun. And over the years, I've talked to Brad Pitt, George Clooney, Anthony Hopkins, Will Smith, Kate Blanchett, Kate Winslet, Glenn Close, James Cameron, Clint Eastwood. It's a pretty imposing list. And Martin Scorsese, of course, who... It's enormous fun to talk to him about movies. Mm. I'd love to talk to him about Hugo, just <laughs> apart from anything else. I would love to talk yeah. to him about that one. Well, that plants another question in my mind. Of the current crop of actors, uh, who are some of your favorites? Well, 
There's so many talented people out there. Mm -hmm. You know, the nominees for Oscar this year, there's always somebody new or somebody, you know, that was unfamiliar until they cracked a certain role. Lily Gladstone in Killers of the Flower Moon is a revelation. And I've seen her before in other films. She's not, not exactly an overnight success, but she's very special. As is Davine Joy Randolph in my favorite film of the year, The Holdovers. I'm sure she's going to have a long career because she's uh, not a one-note actress. So Killian Murphy, uh, we, we've been fans of Peaky Blinders, British crime show for a long time. So we're familiar with him. Now he's got an Oscar nomination for playing Robert Oppenheimer. These are all people I look forward to seeing in anything worthwhile. And, you know, the generation that is retiring now, I, I won't say dying out, but they've been with us a long time. Uh, Gene Hackman is retired now, but Dustin Hoffman still turns up now and then. And uh, Jack Nicholson hasn't said anything about permanent retirement. And Mr. De Niro is working much as he likes. Al Pacino the same. These are giants. Yeah, they certainly are. Well. Now we come to the question that I ask all my guests to kind of wrap things up here. And I think this is probably going to be a harder question for you than anybody I've ever asked it of, just because of your breadth of experience and experiences. And that is, what would you say is your most memorable movie going experience? Well, the one that pops into my head is going to see Apocalypse Now at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York City, a 3,000-seat theater that became, unfortunately, a white elephant. The single screen, large single screen theaters just can't make a go of it anymore. It's tough enough for small theaters to survive, especially now in the post-pandemic era. But the Ziegfeld was a great place to see a movie. And that film, the helicopter attack scene, it's orchestrated by Robert Duvall's character in the film, where I heard the helicopters all around me was the first time I was hyper aware of sound. What a difference sound design could make in a movie presentation. The most recent example of that is I went to see Ferrari, Michael Mann's film Ferrari, which is a terrific movie, but relies heavily on sound to tell its story effectively. I mentioned Apocalypse Now. It kind of reminded me that in the early 80s, I was the production manager at the PBS station in Tulsa, and uh, we got some sort of deal with the filmmakers, and so we got to uh, be on the set of The Outsiders when they were shooting that. Oh, cool. Yeah, and so we spent a lot of time on there, and of course, we kind of had to stay away from Francis, you know. I mean, they kept us away from him, but uh, at one point, it was like at three o'clock in the morning, they were shooting some night scenes and uh, and I was standing there with the camera on my shoulder and Francis was talking to somebody, I'm not sure who, but about probably like 20 feet away from me. And he just suddenly turned and looked at me and said, are you taking my picture? Kind of playful, you know, and they had never talked to us before. And all I could think of was, I should say, don't look at the camera. It's for television. Ah which was his line from Apocalypse Now. And if I'd have said that, he probably would have hired me right there and taken me to L.A. But of course, I just kind of, bleh, 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 you know, so missed my big, my big shot. <laughs> well, I want to thank you again for sparing the time to join us and talk about your experiences, your career, your books, various films. It's something that I've really looked forward to for a very long time, having the opportunity to to have that kind of a, a chat with you. And I, I can only imagine Jim feels the same way. Definitely. Um, well, you know, it's nice to talk to guys. We all speak the same language. And that's the thing about old movie buffs. That's a hyphenated old movie. <laughs> all right. Movie buffs, but old movie buffs. Yeah. Is we do talk the same language. One time I went to the Telluride Film Festival without my wife. I won't go into all of the, the backstory, but we never do anything like that separate. We're always together. One time, and I met up with a film buff there, and I was being escorted. They had a somebody to sort of 
watch over me while I was in town. And he accompanied us to lunch. And at the end of the lunch, he said, I feel like I was at the UN without an interpreter. <laughs> he, he didn't understand a fraction of what we were saying to each other or the references we were pulling out of our hats. But I think we, we would all enjoy an evening together talking and watching. And my, my friend, Janine Basinger, who's the smartest woman I know, mm-hmm. uh, says the only thing better than watching a movie is talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim heads up the Dallas Classic Film Group, and I've been enjoying attending his screenings here. Uh, all, all in uh, 16 millimeter, real film. Great, great. Yeah. And uh, next month's The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Yeah. So that should be fun. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much. My wife, Debbie, says hi. And again, thank you for hi, back to her. For Starstruck. And for anyone who wants to pick up a copy of Starstruck, well, I, I, you've got a page on your website. I should first and foremost mention that where various merchandise can be acquired. Uh, and I gather your books are available through there as well? Or? No, they're not. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, on the Movie Nights and Matinees website, we have a bookshelf page. So there will be images you can click on that will have links to take you to Amazon. And that's you can great. Uh, Thank you for doing that. add these. Oh, that's my pleasure because your books are a pleasure to read. As you say, we speak the same language, read the same language. So I think people uh, discovering these books are really going to enjoy them immensely. And I can't recommend them highly enough. So... Once again, thank you for joining us on Movie Nights and Matinees. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Jim. As previously mentioned, many of Leonard's books can be found on the bookshelf page of the Movie Nights and Matinees website. Clicking on the book cover images will take you to Amazon, where you can learn more about the books and order them. As always, we would appreciate you leaving a rating and, where possible, a review wherever you listen to the podcast. And don't forget to hit the subscribe, download, or follow button, as the case may be, if you haven't already done so. You can leave comments on the website, as well as access some Movie Nights and Matinees merchandise by way of the memorabilia link. Anything from t-shirts to lunchboxes to laptop bags. Also, don't forget to swing by the Facebook page, where you can interact with other listeners and sometimes see some photos related to the episode topics. Well, as much as I'd like to keep basking in the glow of Leonard's appearance here, it's time to draw things to a close and look to episode 26. Goodbye, pal. The time allotted me has expired. Where'd you get that from? I got it off my insurance policy.